everybody. This is the uh, Fields Institute postdoc colloquium, uh, which is an opportunity for all of the postdoctoral fellows at the Fields Institute to get together and talk about the work they're doing in different disciplines of mathematics. So it's a great pleasure to have Alexei Block Gorman, who is going to tell us about fractal dimensions and Vichy automata. Uh, thank you so much, Deirdre, for, for inviting me to speak in the colloquium. Um, so to, to those in my audience, I see a lot of model theorists, but I also see a lot of non-model theorists. So I've, I've taken the, the sort of cautionary step of leaving off all model theory to the end. So that's when I'll touch on it. And the first like 40 minutes should be completely comprehensible to non-model theorists uh, and model theorists alike. Uh, yes. So right. So I'm going to talk mostly about dimension and a little bit about definability of our regular subsets of the reals, um, but also higher arity, so um, Euclidean space. So just to throw out the formal definition, um, because you know sometimes it's nice to, to see exactly what I'm talking about and then maybe what, what the heuristic is. So an automaton is technically a special kind of five tuple, um, Q sigma delta Q zero F, such that Q is the set of states. So I've taken the liberty of putting an automaton diagram. That's what I'll call this, uh, this picture, this graphic that I have here. Um, and in the diagram, the two states are labeled Q0 and Q1. Sigma is a finite alphabet. Um, so in this automaton diagram, the alphabet uh, that you can, you can read off of the, the arrows, which are labeled with characters from the alphabet, uh, here it's zero and one. Delta is what we call the transition function. It's a function from Q cross sigma to Q. Um, rather, it's a, a partial function, or I'll treat it as such. Um, so for each state and each character alpha in my, my alphabet sigma, delta spits out the, the state QJ that the, the, um, the arrow that corresponds to the character alpha uh, goes to from QI, or if there's no arrow labeled alpha, then it just doesn't spit out a state. Q0 is the initial state. So in my automata diagrams, I'll have an arrow labeled start that points to the initial state. And F is the set of except states. So in my automata diagrams, what you'll see is a uh, these will either be indicated in, for my talk, these will be indicated by bold circles. So in the automaton diagram here, the only except state is Q1 because it's, it has a bold encircling. Right, so now I'm gonna talk about what, what automata produce, sort of what, what our, our natural um, means of, of thinking about them is. So for an alphabet sigma, we'll let sigma star denote all string sigma generates. Um, from here on out, I'll call this the Kleene star of any, any arbitrary set. So call any subset L of sigma star a language. And we'll say an automaton A recognizes the language L if for all words on sigma, running A on that input, that, that word, ends in an accept state precisely when that word is in L. So um, just as an example, if we look at this automaton, um, this diagram that I showed you on the previous slide, and we think of it now as being the diagram right for an automaton, we can read off exactly which, which words in zero one star this automaton accepts. Right, we can see that it's, I'll use my pointer. We can see that it's gotta have some number of zeros, possibly no zeros, a one at some point, And then after that one, it can only continue having zeros to stay in the accept state Q1. And so I, I would write this language, the language that this automaton accepts, I would write this as zero star, some number of zeros, one zero star or in set theoretic notation, zero to the n one, zero to the m for n m natural numbers. Right. And if at any point you have questions, 
you know, this is an introductory talk all around. So ask, ask whatever dumb questions that, that pop into your head, please. So regular languages are what we call the <coughs> subsets of sigma star recognized by some automaton. Um, and this, this class of languages are closed under a lot of really, really important operations that we love. Complementation, um, union and intersection, concatenation, Claney star, which I described before, but now you can see on the slide sort of the, the set theoretic notation to, to um, reaffirm what, what you think these words should mean. Um, and I guess I want to add that the class of regular expressions, so I, I gave an example, just words, words that look like um, some combination of Planey star, concatenation, union. Um, so the class of regular expressions, which are generated from sigma by a union, concatenation, and Planey star, this class is equivalent to the class of regular languages. You can sort of you can imagine how you would translate between regular languages and what I've just sort of heuristically defined as regular expressions. So now I'm, I'm moving rather quickly, but that's because um, finite automata have long been a profound interest of, of study from, from multiple perspectives, in particular from uh, you know, computer science, you have the, the hierarchy of, of models of computation, the Chomsky hierarchy, and you can sort of examine uh, finite automata from the perspective of uh, semi-groups, com uh, combinatorics on words. But what's going to interest us um, for, for model theoretically motivated reasons is um, constructions on, on the reals. And so to, to pass to the setting of the real numbers, we're no longer going to consider finite automata in the sense of they take finite strings as inputs, we're going to pass to Bushi automata. Um, and so Bushi automata differ from traditional automata in that they accept infinite length strings, countably, if, you know, indexed by omega, infinite length strings rather than finite length. So we say that the Bushi automaton will accept a string. All we change really, all we change when we pass to Bushi automata is the acceptance condition. So I guess I, I sort of glossed over that in my formal definition, but uh, formally with, with finite automata, a string is accepted if it, if it terminates its run in an accept state. So I, I maybe should, should highlight that more carefully. A string is accepted if it terminates, it's run in an accept state. But with infinite length strings, we can't, we can't talk about termination. So we, we only adjust the acceptance condition to say the automaton accepts an infinite uh, a string indexed by omega if it enters, enters an accept state infinitely often. Right, so, so I'm going to um, try to adjust you to this idea through an example. So let's consider this automaton diagram, right? And here we have, uh, as before, just two states. This time Q0 is the accept state. So uh, in terms of this new acceptance condition, uh, Q0 is the state that we're going to want to enter infinitely often if we're uh, a string indexed by omega hoping to be accepted by the automaton this diagram represents. Uh, Q1 is not an accept state. So we can uh, see from, from the labels on our arrows, the alphabet here uh, is now 0, 1, and 2. And uh, right, so, so we can sort of read off delta, the transition function, by looking at uh, the arrows and their labels. And we can see it just by, by examining that when you enter this automaton, 
um, as a as a we can we can actually view it either as a regular finite state automaton or a Vichy automaton. As a finite state automaton, um, it's clear that finite strings of zeros and twos are are all the strings exactly the strings that this automaton would accept. Because the moment you have a one, you're stuck in Q1 and there's no way to get out of Q1. So you can't terminate um, in Q0 unless you just never have a one to begin with. Now, switching perspective to viewing this as a diagram for a Bushi automaton, we see that we want to enter Q0 infinitely often. So the exact same condition arises. We, we can never have one if we want to have any hope of getting back to Q0. Um, so now as a Bushi automaton, this just accepts all infinite strings of zeros and twos. And so now I want to relate this to real numbers in the following way. So the input strings for this uh, pictured automaton, these can be viewed as ternary representations for points in the zero one interval. So we're going to restrict our attention to the zero one interval um, and you know finite uh, direct products thereof because it's, it's much easier to work in the compact setting. Um, right, so yeah, the, the input strings can be viewed as ternary representations for points in the zero one interval. So i.e. if X is, uh, if X can be written as D1 times a third plus D2 times a ninth and so on, where each of the DIs is in the set zero one two, then we can interpret the, the input D1, D2, et cetera, as um, sort of running our automaton on the, the number X. And so that's how we'll interpret um, the, the uh, sort of automata as, as recognizing a subset of zero one is by saying, right, so I'll, I'll so we'll, we'll say that X, a subset of zero one, is R regular if there is a Bucci automaton that accepts an input precisely if the input is a base R expansion, as, as displayed here, for some, some element of big X. And I guess there is like a small nuance here, which is technically with, with base R representations, you can have multiple representations, um, but it's, a, it's an easy exercise to show that the relation of um, being our representations for the same number is itself uh, recognized by a Bucci automaton. Alexi, can I ask a question here? Yes, of course. Um, so I, it, it, it seems like you, you've, you've given the definition of being, of the infinite string being accepted if it enters the accept state infinitely often. And it seems mm -hmm. like you could instead make the definition if it, um, if at some point it stays in an, or it stays in an accept state, or if you have more than one accept state, that it doesn't leave the set of accept states you know, forever, forever after. And in the example you've given, these two are the same, but I presume it would not always be the same. Can yeah, you discuss yeah, that so choice? Yes, that that uh, condition of if it stays in an accept state forever after um, gives a, a much, much less rich notion of of our regular um, because what's what winds up happening is that all you can have is either the same digit repeating infinitely or one of, you know, finitely many and then you just get cantor sets all the way down basically either a single point or cantor sets all the way down. Um, so, so actually, there are um, a lot more sets than that which are recognized by Bucci automata. Um, and I guess <laughs> to really explain why this acceptance condition is a good choice, I wouldn't say the right choice because there are other acceptance conditions. There are things called Muller automata, things called Rabin automata, and they have different acceptance conditions that are a little more complicated. Um, but um, yeah, so, so the, the short answer is 
that would be sort of much less rich. The long answer is there are other acceptance conditions and it's kind of a complicated world. Okay. Yeah. yeah, good question, yeah. Right, so, so I just wanna highlight um, what, what said exactly this uh, Bushi automaton whose diagram I've shown you recognizes, right? And so those of you with, with your thinking caps on have surely already um, you know, deduced, already done the, the calculation. Um, but this, this automaton will accept uh, an element of the zero one interval precisely if uh, it's an element of the two thirds, the classic two thirds Cantor set. And so we'll sort of hold on to this, this particular example as sort of a guiding example in some ways. Right, so now I, I you know, gave the definition of a finite automaton, and then I talked about regular languages, and so now we should talk about regular omega languages. So regular omega languages are the subsets of sigma to omega. So by sigma to omega, I, I do mean, um, you know, sequences indexed by omega such that each each element of the sequence is a, a character in sigma, right? So maybe I'll just put that on the board for, for us to remember, um, for, for an arbitrary set. So X set, I'm using the, the set theoretic notation. Set of Right, so, so the subsets of sigma to omega recognized by some Bushi automaton, uh, these can be expressed in terms of regular languages in the sense of finite automata. And so that's gonna give us a lot of ammunition. Bushi automata a priori could be incredibly complicated to understand and not have a very meaningful relationship with finite automata, which, which accept you know, finite strings, uh, but, but thankfully due to Bushi when, when he introduced Bushi Automata, he showed that there is this very strong relationship. So yeah, Bushi's theorem from 62 says that for every L, a language in sigma two omega, that is recognized by a Bushi Automaton, there are actually regular languages. So V1 through VK and W1 through WK are subsets of sigma star. Right. Um, so there exist these V1 through VK, W1 through WK, such that we can write L as this union of we take VI, we concatenate on the right WI to omega, um, where as I as I wrote over there, WI to omega is just um, you know sequences of of elements in WI indexed by omega. So I'll call. Uh, I'll call languages of this wi to omega form, I'll call those omega powers of regular languages. So this theorem is very, very useful to us, very powerful. And so as some examples, illustrating Bushi's theorem for the Cantor set, um, which I'll, I'll call calligraphic C, we see that VI is the empty language, or V1 is the empty language, W1 is the language 0, 2. That's it. For, I'm going to use blackboard bold D to re represent the restricted dyadic rationals. So dyadic rationals between 0 and 1. And we can see that for, for D, V1 is going to be 0, 1 star. And W1 is just going to be the character zero. And that's all we need. Um, so these two are sort of basic because we, we only need a V1 and a W1 for each as opposed to multiple VIs and WIs. And so this, this, these dyadic rationals, um, I will also ask you to keep in mind as sort of a, an anti-guiding example. <laughs> Um, yeah. 
Uh, so, right. So now I want to mention the interaction of the order topology on the zero one interval with these, these um, R regular sets that we've defined. So I guess, okay, I, um, I put this, this word, oh, um, this word trim right here. So uh, I, I should define it maybe a trim automaton is just one where if you had a state that wasn't accessible from the start state, you just trim it off. Um, you, you write an equivalent automaton without that state. Or if you had a state which doesn't have a path back to an accept state, then we sort of again consider it redundant and you can find an equivalent automaton that you just trim that state off. Uh, I call automata equivalent if they recognize the same subset of sigma star for finite automata and sigma two omega for Vichy automata. So I guess it's it's not hard to show that given a Vichy automaton, you can find an equivalent in the sense of recognizing the same language uh, trim automaton. Um, but so, right, we say that a trim Vichy automaton is closed if every state is an acceptance state. Um, so this sort of comes back to what, what Deirdre was asking. Um, this, is, this is a very special subtype of Vichy automata. Um, so we'll write overline calligraphic A for the automaton that it results from making every state accepting. Um, and if you think the word closed and the overline is leading terminology and notation, it, it certainly is. Um, so uh, an important fact, a non-trivial fact, is that if the set X, I, I just wrote set, but I mean if X, a subset of 0, 1 to the D, D a natural number, is recognized by an automaton A, then the topological closure of X is recognized by the automata theoretic closure of A. So just uh, as, as a, you know, guiding uh, ourselves with intuition, if we take this, uh, if we take X to be the dyadic rationals, this here is a trim, you can check that this, this is a trim automaton that recognizes D. Um, and then, right, we see, we see that it's not closed because Q0 is not an accept state. So it's not closed in the automata theoretic sense and certainly uh, D is not closed in the order topology. Do you have a question, Maria? Yeah, do you have um, an arrow coming out of Q0, two arrows coming out of Q0 with all zero? Oh, yes, I'm so sorry. Um, I, I fudged the definition of automata just a little. So technically, we allow it to be a multifunction. I'm very sorry. I, I, I didn't think I'd be called out on that. Um, we call this type of automaton non-deterministic, which means you have multiple arrows with the same label. For finite automata, so this is actually a really good point to bring up. For finite automata, deterministic and non-deterministic automata are equivalent as classes because you can do what we call a power set construction, which is what you think it is. Like you sort of add a bunch of states that correspond to all possible, you know, different directions you could take, so to speak. For Bushi automata, this is no longer an equivalence of classes. There are, and in fact, this is an example of, it's, it's non-trivial to show, but this automaton is an example of a Bushi automaton that is non-deterministic, which does not have an equivalent deterministic Bushi automaton. Um, and that's, that's sort of an interesting point of nuance. This is part of why other types of acceptance conditions were defined. You don't have this problem with, for example, Muller automata. Can I also ask a definition, yeah. a question about the, the, uh, the closure? So mm -hmm. if every state is accepting, does that not mean that every, um, every word is accepted? Not necessarily. So I guess, this is a, a good chance for me to mention, uh, I might have to go, okay, this, this diagram in this slide, this is not a trim automaton. Um, look at the diagram and maybe you can, you can convince yourself, you can see that if I took off the state Q1, 
This is where the partial function thing comes in, right? Because I don't need to have an arrow for every character in my alphabet from every state. And so I can take off Q1, erase all the arrows going to it. And now I have a trim automaton. Um, and certainly uh, it's closed because I've gotten rid of Q1. I only have Q0 and that's an accept state, but it still recognizes the cantor set. So, so that's why I really did want to include trim when I defined closed or closure. Um, because, because right, otherwise you'd run into exactly what you're pointing out, Deirdre. Yeah. Okay, but so, so back to the dyadic rationals, we can take the closure just by making Q0, just by making Q0 an accept state now. And suddenly, yes, it recognizes every single um, binary representation of every element in zero one. And, and indeed, that is the topological closure. So we're happy that, um, you know, sort of our, our basic example uh, obeys this fact. Yeah. Yeah, so trim just means that there's no state which you can't get to from the start state, which would be silly. Um, and also, there's no state that doesn't have a path to an accept state. Right, so the one I showed for Cantor set, there is no way to get from that Q1 state back to an accept state, and so we wouldn't call it trim. Yeah. Yeah, good questions all around. Right, so now I'm, I'm going to um, throw you for a bit of a loop maybe and talk about fractal dimensions. So we're going to let X, a subset of R to the D be non-empty and bounded. We're going to define two types of fractal dimensions and then we're gonna compare how they behave for these R regular sets. So if you haven't seen this before, I'll try to give a heuristic. Don't, don't worry too much about the exact limb soup limb and definition but so technically there's upper box counting dimension and lower box counting dimension we're only going to concern ourselves with when both of those agree so i'm going to define the box counting dimension of this x as when the limb soup of log of this function i've defined below n of x epsilon over log of one over epsilon agrees with the limb inf of um log of the same function n of x epsilon over log of whatever epsilon. So this, this function n of x epsilon, this just spits out the number of sets of this particular form. So i sub z is just you take an integer tuple z1 through zd and you're scaling it down by epsilon. So you're making it into a box um, of side length epsilon for each side, right? And so you're allowed to uh, translate these boxes and n of x epsilon counts how many of these boxes translated to cover the set x are needed, like sort of the minimum, right? Um, number of, of these epsilon cubes needed to, to cover x. And so we're, we're taking the log of that, that number of boxes needed to, to cover X, then dividing by the log of one over epsilon. Um, right, and so this is just called box counting dimension. Um, and it, it, you know, it comes up in, in fractal geometry. Okay, so different kind of dimension, we're going to define Hausdorff S measure. So first we define Hausdorff measure and then from that the dimension. So Hausdorff S measure, I'll write mu superscript S subscript H of X is we're taking the limb inf of, we're, we're looking at U sub I can be any collection of sets of diameter at most epsilon covering X. Um, I guess I, I'm sort of <laughs> implying this in my limb inf, but I should say it explicit, explicitly. We, we're also taking U sub I to be minimal, like minimal um, in terms of the number of, of 
use of I is needed, <coughs> sets of dimension at most epsilon that form a cover of X. And then we're, we're infamizing um, the sum of the, the diagrams of these use of I's, but raised to the power S. Right. Okay, so, so this bears some resemblance to box counting dimension, but, but a priori it looks quite different, right? Because we're infamizing this sum of these diameters of these similar covers, though a little different, but we're raising them to the, to the power S to get the S measure, the Hausdorff S measure. And then we define the dimension as the unique real number S for which if you take any S prime greater than S, then the, the Hausdorff S prime measure is zero. And conversely, if you take any S prime smaller than S, then the S prime measure, the Hausdorff S prime measure of X is infinity. Um, notice I haven't said anything about the Hausdorff S measure. So it's possible that that for S, the Hausdorff um, S measure can be zero, it can be in infinite, it can be a non-zero finite number. We're not, we're just saying, we're just remarking on the behavior um, sort of of S as, as a, a sort of point of inflection where it switches from having trivial Hausdorff measure to infinite Hausdorff measure. Right, and so I should, observe that in general for for x subset of r to the n uh, bounded these dimensions satisfy the inequality that the the hausdorff measure will in general be less than or equal to the box counting measure okay so um, again, more more guiding examples of what at what what dimensions, what box counting dimension and house graph dimension do we observe in the wild? So for the Cantor set, I won't go through the the computation, but you know you can you can do the um, the calculation by hand. The Hausdorff dimension of the Cantor set is log base three of two. That's the power you want to raise raise those diameters to in that sum that we implemise over. And actually, this is the same. You can do the like, uh, take the limit and use the, the log rules to work out that log base three of two is also the box counting dimension of the Cantor set. So it's interesting that for the Cantor set, these two seemingly different notions of dimension agree with each other, which sort of separately have importance in fractal geometry. For the dyadic rationals, so I guess it's easy to cheat to see that the Hausdorff dimension of the dyadic rationals is zero because you can actually show that for any countable set, the Hausdorff dimension will be zero. Um, but this is not true of box counting dimension. So because the dyadic rationals is actually dense in the zero one interval, um, it turns out that the box counting dimension, which box counting dimension of, of, uh, of these sets will, will agree with their, that of their closure, topological closure. Um, so, so for box counting dimension, um, the calculation actually shows that the box counting dimension is one. Right, so, so now, uh, now that we sort of observed some things about these dimensions for our, our guiding examples, I'm going to remark on when these dimensions agree generally. So fix R a natural number greater than zero and let X pre denote the, the prefixes. So we're ranging over all length, uh, length and prefixes of elements of, of X, I guess, written out in their, in their base R expansions um, for all N. And we'll define what's called entropy. This is another, another one of those uh, sort of notions of growth dimension behavior that sort of pops up in a lot of different contexts. 
So we'll define entropy of X, specifically X, um, a subset of sigma star. I'm not going to define entropy for actually for um, uh, subsets of sigma to omega, just sigma star. So we'll define this as the limb soup of the log of the number of length n prefixes. So here, here I was ranging over all n right, right here in this part. I'm, I'm only, I'm stopping at a fixed n. Um, right, so the log of the number of length n prefixes for elements in x divided by n. So uh, I guess an important fact that, that simplifies greatly simplifies computing the box counting dimension specifically for our regular set is that um, if X is an R regular subset of zero one to the D, the box counting dimension is actually just off from the entropy of its prefix language by a factor of one over log R. Um, so that's really convenient because obviously we would much rather compute this limit for a finite, a regular language of finite strings, then deal with, you know, computing box counting dimension for, for subsets of, of zero one. And moreover, if X is closed, the Hausdorff dimension will agree with the box counting dimension. And this is where you're like, oh yeah, the Cantor set is closed, but of course the dyadic rationals aren't. Yeah. So, it's not always, you know, puppies and fairies and, and good things. There are also times when the dimensions will disagree. So for an infinite or finite Fucci automaton, A, with states indexed by I, the cycle language, which I'll denote C sub I of A, will define this to be a subset of sigma star that contains all strings in sigma star such that there is a run of A from state I to itself via that word. So when you follow you know, the, the transition function delta um, according to the, the characters in W, you get a run from state I back to itself. We'll call that the cycle language. So um, the theorem that um, my, my academic brother, um, who's a grad student at, at UIUC, we showed that for an automaton A with states indexed by I, if this is a trim Bushi automaton, and we suppose that A recognizes the set X, let X sub I denote the omega power of these cycle languages C sub I of A, and let F be the set of indices of accept states. Then what our computations showed was that the Hausdorff dimension can actually be reduced to, to taking the max over the, the accept states of the Hausdorff dimension of these omega powers of the cycle language corresponding to those accept states. So this is sort of giving us an algorithm to reduce the computation of the Hausdorff dimension to that of sort of these cycle languages, which just sort of focus on for the accept states, sort of what's what's in their SCC. It's sort of a, a reduction of, of sort of um, maybe a, an arbitrary, a complex um, automaton to, to, I guess, the strongly connected components that we, we sort of think of as a sub automaton in this particular set. But conversely, the box counting dimension, we actually show it's given by taking the max over all the states, not just the, the accept states, of the Hausdorff dimension of the cycle language, uh, the omega power of the cycle language corresponding to all, all of the states. So, so now we can just sort of, by looking, just by looking at the automaton diagram, we can quickly see if the Hausdorff dimension and box counting dimension will agree or disagree um, just by, by examining for each of the, the states what their cycle language looks like and seeing if, if one of the non-accept states has a higher Hausdorff dimension um, for the, the omega power of the cycle language than, than those of the accept states. 
Right. Um, and so I guess just to illustrate one more time with, with our, our favorite examples. So this is, as we said before, the trimification of the um, Bushi automaton recognizing C and computing the max, at, we just, we're just checking our intuition, computing the max over all the except states, that's the same in this case as computing the max over all states of the Hausdorff dimension of these omega powers of cycle languages. And we can easily read off the cycle language. It's just the same, the same as, as the Cantor set. Right, so, so according to our theorem, these should agree and they do. Uh, but conversely, for the trim automaton recognizing the dyadic rationals, um, we see that, right, taking the max over the cycle languages for just the omega powers of the, the cycle languages for except states, all we get is um, zero to omega because the one except state only has an arrow going back to itself labeled zero. Versus when we do it for all states, of course, with Q zero, the cycle language is all strings. So we're going to get that the house for convention is one. Right, so this is what we've already seen, but you know, sort of the theorem confirms um, what we observed. Right, and then I, I think I'll talk really quick, really quick about computing Hausdorff measure. Actually, I'm not entirely sure if I'm going to 1250 or 1255. <laughs> uh, well, I think you had technically started at 10 past, but I have to be leave promptly for at one. So how about five okay. more minutes? Yeah, perfect. Sounds good. Okay. Um, right. So then to talk about Hausdorff measure, because we also have an algorithm for computing Hausdorff measure that's in a similar manner, we need to define unambiguous automata. So we say an automaton is unambiguous if for every infinite string that's accepted by, by the Bushi automaton A, there is exactly one accepting run. So note that if you're deterministic and for each string, there's only one path you can follow, you're unambiguous automatically. If you're not deterministic, you can still be unambiguous and you can check that technically the right condition for unambiguous is um, like what, what in the literature they call co-deterministic and co-complete, which I won't bother getting into. But, um, but so this is, this is a non-trivial thing to check in the non-deterministic case is my point. Um, yeah. So I guess in, in particular, there might be many um, you know, there might be re many runs on a string W which are accepted. The automaton is only unambiguous if all of the many runs are eventually rejected save for one, which witnesses acceptance. Right, so now I'm gonna define something slightly complicated. For I, one of the, one of the states in A, let PI be the set of prefixes W restricted to N, such that A accepts W, but no acceptance run of A on the, the length N prefix enters the SCC, the strongly connected component of the state I. And uh, I guess I said a run <laughs> of W, but what I mean is um, the acceptance run of W does enter that strongly connected component on the next character to be read in after the nth character. Um, and I guess moreover, like um, because, because it's entering a strongly connected component, if this strongly connected component witnesses acceptance, then uh, it'll stay in that strongly connected component sort of to the end, right? Because if it left and came back, well then that other place it went was part of the strongly connected component. So, so this is well-defined. It looks a little complicated, but it is, P sub i is, is a well-defined set. Um, one has to check. So, so what Christian and I show is that for A uh, with set of states i, A is unambiguous, and A recognizes the set x 
As before, we'll let x sub i denote the omega power of the cycle languages for the state i. Uh, yeah. And f index is the set state, uh, the accept states. So if the Hausdorff dimension is alpha, then the, the Hausdorff uh, or the, yeah, the Hausdorff alpha measure of the set can actually be expressed as the maximum over the accept states of the sum over these, these prefixes, these special prefixes in P sub i of the Hausdorff alpha measure of the, the omega power of the cycle language divided out by this correction factor, which is r to the alpha, uh, r to the alpha times length of u. And that's the correction factor because we're sort of we're we're sort of taking some some the, the prefix as some path you have to follow before you get to the SCC. Um, and then we can we can sort of read off um, right the 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 uh, Hausdorff alpha measure of, of the omega power of the cycle language, but where we are correcting for the the sort of path we took to get there, where where we're sort of shrinking and shrinking and shrinking is how we view these prefixes. The longer they get, the more sort of we're we're shrinking within our space. Um, it's, it's easier if I had a picture, but I I didn't have time to make one. Um, but so this is nice that we sort of have a similar um, characterization of the Hausdorff uh, alpha measure for uh, Hausdorff dimension alpha sets. Um, yeah. So I'm almost done. I did want to remark on applications to model theory really quickly. So <laughs> I've been calling calligraphic C the Cantor set, but of course, call C a subset of R just a Cantor set if it's compact, has no interior, and no isolated points. This is sort of the set theoretic notion of a Cantor set. So if X is a subset of 0, 1 to the N and is R regular, we can look at the, the first order structure given by taking the reals um, as an ordered additive group and adding a predicate for the set X. And then what we show is that there is there exists a set A in 0, 1 definable in this, this first order structure, R less than plus X, such that the Hausdorff dimension disagrees with the box counting dimension of the set A, precisely when either a Cantor set in this sense is definable in that structure, or a set that is both dense and codense in some interval is definable in that structure. So this sort of nicely characterizes, I guess there, I don't have time to describe it fully, but there's this structure of independent interest, R less than V sub K, where V sub K is this special ternary predicate. Um, this has, has significance because it's definable sets are those recognized, recognized by um, K automata. And so we sort of are able to say a lot about Hausdorff and box counting dimension in, in special redux of that, that distinguished structure. Um, and, and I think there's more, more to sort of milk out of um, this connection. And that's, that's everything I wanted to say. Yeah. So here's my references. Well, just a couple. Oh, thank you, Alexi.